Run two. <laughs> That's a good job. That's a very good job. The choir did a good job this morning. I think it's a new member y'all had in the choir this morning. It made it special. All right, now if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to the book of Proverbs, chapter 4. When you get to chapter 4, find verse 23. Chapter 4 of Proverbs. I'll give you a minute to find that. And verse 23. One verse, but that one verse says so much. Keep thine heart with all thy diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Let me read it again. Verse 23. Keep thine heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. In 1995, the Prime Minister of Israel was assassinated. And when the investigation came down, they found that the his bodyguards didn't, didn't uh, heed the protocol that they should have. As a result of that, this man lost his life. The bodyguard. We're used to bodyguards. We see them on TV. They guard the presidents all the time. They guard some of the congressmen. They guard uh, some of the extremely wealthy people. They are bodyguards to guard them at all, at all times. We are by nature guards. We are by our nature bodyguards. We guard, first of all, our families. We guard their safety. Got a shotgun hanging on the wall. 45 in one drawer, 22 in another. Automatic rifle at the other end of the house. Why well, you got all that? You are determined that you are going to keep your family safe. Not only physical safe, but you're going to also guard them emotionally. You don't want anybody disturbing your family. You're going to guard them emotionally. You're going to guard them financially. Because you want to be sure there are food on the table. There's money for college. So you guard your family. Not only that, we guard our possessions. If you have any land, you uh, most of us have a have a fence around it, don't we? Eight strand barbed wire fence. Why we got that? Because we want to guard our property. We put up no trespassing signs. Why? We don't want we don't want everybody killing our deer on our land, do we? We guard, we guard our property. Not only that, we guard important papers, deeds and so forth, and wills. We guard those. Now, if they got the picture of dead presidents on them, we really got them. Put them in a safe place. I'm talking about money now, if y'all didn't catch it. <laughs> Some things are worth guarding. Some things deserve to be guarded. Here's what the Bible says, above all, above everything, put it at the top of the list, guard your affections, guard your heart. For out of it, for out of it, are the, all the issues of life. Now why is that? Remember in the Bible when Jesus was born about three years later the wise men came to where he was at and they were following something. They were following a star. Remember that in the Bible and the Gospels? They were following. That star was a point of reference. That star would lead them where they wanted to go. So what the Bible is saying is this. There is a point of reference in your life and the Bible calls it affection or your heart. It is the sum total of all that you are. And the Bible says guard that. See, why is a man an alcoholic? Because he did not guard his affection. Why is a man a drug addict or a woman a drug addict? Because they did not guard their affections and they were led astray. Person that would cheat on his mate or her mate. Why is that? Because they have not guarded their affections. I want to say three things on this subject of a bodyguard. First of all, there is the command. The command says this, keep thy heart. Keep thy affection. Keep thy heart. Keep that control. 
The word affection, instant word, it means that which the inward man has set his mind toward. In other words, there's something in your life you've got your mind set toward. That's your motion, emotion. That's your drive, you see. And there is always a constant danger. Don't ever think you've got a safe harbor. There is always a constant danger. In 1973, me and uh, several of the men where I was pastoring at that time went to Mobile to the Evangelism Conference and we had a couple of hours there to kill in between conferences and we toured the USS Alabama that was docked there as, as a show place then. We went on that thing and we had with us Sonny Preston. Sonny was an old Navy man so he really made it interesting. He knew what everything was. But what amazed me was the technology they had back in the 30s. Torpedoes operated by magnetic pull. They could demagnetize the whole, whole ship even back then. But we got up on the deck and I, uh, there, was a, there was a cabin there and the metal, and I'm not exaggerating, was that thick. And I asked Sonny, I said, why is the metal so thick? He said, this is where the commanding officer stays. And they've got to protect and guard that commanding officer. And that's exactly what the Bible is saying here. We have a commanding officer in our life. It is our affection. It is our heart. It is all of us. We're used to living distance in ourselves. Meet you on the earth. Six foot. Got to get back six foot. At least that's the way it used to be. That there has to be some distances as far as we're concerned away from those things that would hinder us and hurt us. Keep Keep your distance. Stay away from your weakness. You got a weakness, stay away from it, you see. I read a story in the Western days, this fella had a, he was a drinking man, but he got saved. So when he goes back to town, he ties his horse up in front of the saloon, just like he always did. Well, the old man standing by said, he better watch yourself, he's going to be in trouble. What does he say? He said, distance yourself from anything that might hinder you and keep you from being what God wants you to be. But there is a delusion going on as far as the world is concerned. Jesus said this, I came that you might have life and you might have life more abundantly. Mm -hmm. Then Jesus said, the poor will be with you always. I don't know how true this is, but I read some time back that God made this earth in such a manner and so productive that it would provide $10 million for everybody that would ever be born. Now, the last time I told you that, I asked for my $10 million back. <laughs> but nobody's volunteered until this morning. Now I know where Elliot got his money. <laughs> <laughs> Ten million dollars. But so what's happened? What's happened? Why have I not got my fair share? Well, there's, there's two reasons. First of all, I probably wasn't industrious enough. I wasn't wise enough and smart enough. And then, you know, there's a lot of greed. We read about folks who have billions and billions of dollars, and that's that's uh, I'm certainly not down on rich folks at all. Now then, they say that in the world there are 31% of all the world population are Christians. 31% of all the world are Christians. But out of that 31% that's Christians, only one out of four are evangelical Christians. Now, an evangelical Christian is one that believes that Jesus was the Son of God. He came to die for my sins on the cross. He was resurrected the third day, and He's coming back. Amen. That's an evangelical Christian's concept. Um, but you know, it seems to me like, seems to me like that we have got all it takes. We've got all it takes. God's put the Holy Spirit in our hearts Man, if there's anybody in this world that needs to be and it should be blessed, it is God's people. Amen. Amen. 
So not only is there the command, but second of all, there is the commodity. What is it that we're supposed to partake? The Bible says it is our affection or our heart. Now the heart means all of us. The heart means every bit of us. First of all, your heart is who you are. It is who you are. You see, you're made in the image of God. You're made in the image of God. You are a child of God. Now listen, there are no limits to what a man, if he's any kind of a man, would do for his child or his grandchild or his great-grandchildren. Listen, folks, you're like me. We'd walk through hell if we had to for those children and those grandchildren. You see, it is our, our heart is who we are. Who we are. Not only is it who we are, it is what we are. What we are. Heavenly, remember this, fellas. You're a heavenly creatures wrapped in earthly robes. Amen. From time to time, you must, re you must remind your spouse of that. <laughs> <laughs> you are heavenly creatures, folks, men and women, wrapped in earthly robes. We're citizens of heaven. We're citizens in two places. Not only am I a citizen in heaven, but I'm a citizen of this earth, of the United States of America, of Orange County, Alabama. I'm a citizen. I've got a responsibility. I got a responsibility to God. I got a responsibility for that citizenship. But I got a responsibility also for my earthly citizenship as well. But not only is it who you are and what you are, it is all that you are. See, Jesus said this, let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus. In the temptation, He withstood that temptation because He guarded His affection. He did not turn no stone into bread. He did not jump off of the pinnacle of the temple. He did not fall down and worship the devil to get all the worldly goods. Why? Because, because He guarded His affection. So we looked at the command. We looked at the commodity. Now let's look at the channel. Here's what the Bible says. An issue. The word issue means fountain or something going forward. And Jesus said, out of you, if you believe in me, out of you shall flow rivers. Not river now. Rivers of living, living water. Rivers of living water. What is it that flows from the Christian? What should the world sense about it? What should they see in their life? I think the number one thing is that of love. Amen. People are to Jesus said, by this you will all people know you're my disciples that you have love for one another. The Bible says this. Now about it in 1 Corinthians 13, it says it's now by the faith, hope, and love, but the greater is love. Now there's three kinds of love, folks. There is first of all romantic love. Romantic love. Now, those of us as married, we've been through, we've gone through that loop and we know what it what it's all about. And in the Bible, I, I like uh, Jacob and Rachel. They are they fascinate me. Especially especially uh, especially Jacob. Man, this guy, when he saw her in his head, yeah, I mean, it's it is, it is whatever you call it on top of his head, flip through <laughs> Man, that's the worst thing he ever seen. Now, they had a well there, and she'd wait to feed her to water her sheep. Took about four or five guys to lift that rock. You know what he did? He ran over and grabbed that thing up, and I ain't just seeing as he looked back at Rachel to be sure she was watching. Judy, I thought about uh, Scott. <laughs> I bet he showed off like that in his race with you. Think? I'll tell you, he was, he was in love with this woman. Show it off at the rock. Water dogs up. Water to all those animals. You know, if you ever taught a Sunday school class, if you've got a boy and a girl eyeing each other, <laughs> You ain't gonna get too much attention. You ain't gonna get now paper watch ago, those airplanes are go, sneakering will go on. And they look at each other out of the side of the eyes, you know then it's getting real, real serious. But then there is brotherly love. Brotherly love. <laughs> David was a 
friend of Jonathan. That's an unusual friendship. Jonathan was the son of Saul. Saul hated David, wanted to kill him. But Jonathan and Saul got killed. And Jonathan had a little five-year-old boy named Mephibosheth. As his nurse fled with him to get him away from the war, she fell and crippled him for a while. And David sent for him when he found out and he said it at the king's table. Amen. Right. Brotherly love. Brotherly love. Amen. Brotherly love is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Amen. Abraham had a nephew named Lot. Lot went down to Sodom. And while he was there, here came an army through, captured him and his family and his goods, we carried him off. Abraham went and rescued him. What's Lot? Then he goes back. He goes back to Sodom. It's, it's amazing how people don't get the message that God sends to them. Let me bring something closer than that. And about 1968, 67, my mother was terribly sick. Matter of fact, she died in 68 with heart trouble. But that summer, she was desperately ill in the hospital for months and months. Our garden did and the ladies from Landerful Methodist Church came together there. Folks, I have never I've never brother in love. Folks, we need brother in love. It's wonderful that we love God, Amen. but we need to love our brothers and women. Then not only is there romantic love and brotherly love, there's also Christian love. Love is the birthmark of the Christian. Amen. Mark it down. Amen. I see people that don't love folks. I question their salvation. Amen. Because love, love one another. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. Where does the ability to love come from? Well, I must drop a little bit, but I'll let you down. I'd be on your case. Where does it come from? It comes from God. Amen. Folks, I couldn't love God or anybody else without the love of God flowing through me, not the way that I not the way that I should should love. Now some people are love, are easy to love. Most people are not easy to love. As a matter of fact, without the love of God flowing through us, we are savages. Go with me now. I mean we're savages. We really are, boy. You treat us for something wrong, and we're 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 bad. We're bad to you, yes. Christians. First of all, you ought to love God. Amen. If you don't love God, you got to stay, take that first step first. You ought to love God. Then you ought to love your church. Man, I think you're supposed to love. The, the Bible said that Jesus died for the church. If Jesus died for it, I ought to have feelings for it. I ought to try to do everything I can to get the church going and to help it and motivate it, you see. I read a story of this couple in the in the 30s during the Great Depression. They were in Oklahoma. The woman had, uh, had, had a sickness, tuberculosis, and so they decided to go to California, and they started, they got it for Texas, and she got real bad. And they stopped there in a little town in Texas, she went into the county hospital there, and while she was there and in the process of dying, she said to the nurse, is there a Baptist church here in this town? And he says, yes, there is. She said, would you ask the pastor to come to see me? And of course, he came. And while he was there, she said to one of her children, sweetheart, she said, go get Jesus' money. And the child went and got three of them. She said, this is all the money we have saved since we left. And I want you to give this to the church. Now the Bible says, God will bless you a hundredfold. Amen. Go with me. Amen. Pretty soon on the community knew about that. She passed away and, and uh, the community was talking about it. The church was talking about it. And a man who owned the general store said, I'll give this man a job. Yeah, the store. Another fellow said, I've got a house that nobody's living in. I'll let him build in it free. 
So here's a man who's got a job, he's got a house, he's in a church and people loves him. God do know how to bless you, folks. Amen. He does know how to bless you. Through God, through Jesus Christ, has given us an example of love. He so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. Now that's love. For God to send His Son into this world to redeem us of our sins. I thought about the man in the tomb. The man in the tomb that was demon-possessed. Many demons in him. When Jesus healed him, and those demons left, now folks, he didn't get reformed. A lot of things is wrong with the church today. There's too many people reformed and not enough people born again. Amen. This guy got born again. He got saved. He got born again. What does he do? He's not sitting around. The Bible said that he went through ten cities telling people what God had done for him. Let me tell you something else you need to guard. You need to guard your opportunities that God gives you. Amen. You need to guard those opportunities. The Bible said, Jesus said, now is a day of salvation. Here comes a rich young ruler. No doubt, he's seeking God. He said, good master, what can I do to you have eternal life? I want to be saved. I want to, I want to go to heaven. And Jesus said, okay, you got one problem. It's unique to you. But you got a unique problem. I want you to sell everything you got, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. And the Bible said that he walked away grieved because he had great possessions. He walked away free. He had missed his opportunity. How many people right now is suffering in hell? I mean, they're burning and they're hurting and they can remember the many opportunities they've had as they sat in the church pew and listened to the preacher Sunday after Sunday and yet walked away. In all the year, in all the world, there's three kind of homes. First of all, First of all, there he is, an open heart. An open heart will hear the Word of God. You receive, you receive the Word of God. You're open to the things of God. Then there is the hardened heart. People harden their heart. The Bible says, Jesus said to the Israelites, don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. See, the thing that it is, the longer I put off being saved, if God's convicted me, my heart's going to get harder and harder and harder. But there's a third account, and that's a flooded heart. That's a heart that's heard the Word of God, they've accepted it, and out of them flows this river of living water that the Lord talks about. And out of them flows the Word of God and the, and the, and the love that's supposed to be. The Son of God, said this author, put on humanity that sons of men might put on divinity. The Son of God became the Son of Man that man became the sons of God. The sons of God became, came from heaven to earth that the sons of man might go from earth to heaven. The Son of God suffered, bled, and died on the cross that sons of men might live, that they might not perish but have everlasting life. What a wonderful Savior, the writer says. It's an absolute truth, he goes on to say, when I say that all the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever been built, all the parliaments, all the congress that have ever sat, all the judges who have ever judged, and all the statesmen who have ever spoken, and all the kings who have ever reigned, all of them put together have not affected the life of a man upon the earth as powerful as Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Lord, our Savior, and soon come to King of Kings. Amen. 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 Time for invitation. Amen. Amen. Blessed Lord God, thank you, Lord, that we have the ability to know this man personally. Thank you, Lord.
You saw us lost in our sin. The Holy Spirit came to us, convicted us of that sin. And Lord, we came to you. God, from that time on, all of us here that know you as our Savior, you have blessed us beyond our wildest imagination. Maybe not with money, maybe not with physical things, but Lord, you blessed us so many other ways with families and health and all those things that money we put a price on. Now, Lord, I pray this morning as we sing this invitation song, if there's ours, those here today, God, that have not been born again, not been saved, I pray, God, this will be the hour that they will come to the throne of God and come to this altar and receive you as their personal Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.